Stephen Strange. The Illuminati will see you now. We will see what kind of Doctor Strange you are. Welcome back everyone, this will be my full Doctor Strange 2 breakdown easter eggs for the entire movie. There are so many things we have to talk about, so if you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. Careful for spoilers for the movie, if you haven't seen it yet, we'll be talking about everything that happens because they set up a lot of stuff. We'll just start at the beginning and work our way through shot by shot talking about easter eggs, WTF moments as we go along. So the first big thing is this movie is notable because it's one of the few Marvel movies where the director of the movie dropped out before the sequel. So Scott Derrickson, who's mostly known for directing hardcore R-rated traditional horror movies, left the movie. Originally, he'd hyped it up about being Marvel's first horror film. That's what allows Sam Raimi to come back to the Marvel Universe, direct a new Marvel movie, even though technically this is his first MCU movie, now Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man movies that he directed are canon to the MCU, Marvel Cinematic Multiverse technically. But he's also had a long history of directing horror films with a lot of comedy in them, most notably the Evil Dead series, with a lot of Bruce Campbell in them. There's a lot of references for those films in this, including Bruce Campbell himself. Klaatu, Murata, <laughs> But a lot of the horror elements, the camera techniques that they used during the film were specific Sam Raimi techniques that you see in his other films, like when they take first person perspective, when Scarlet Witch is chasing them down all across different parts of the film. He also uses a lot of jump scares, especially at the ends of his films, kind of like they do at the end of this film, with Doctor Strange casually walking down the street like it's no big deal until he clutches his head in pain as the third eye emerges. They start with the Marvel Phase 4 logo. It's updated to include mostly Doctor Strange specific footage inside the logo itself. They do this for a lot of the Marvel Phase 4 movies. And in some cases, like the WandaVision series or the Loki series, they'll give them custom Marvel intros that'll look way different. This series serves as sort of a continuation of WandaVision, as if they had a WandaVision episode 10, 11, 12. Originally, Doctor Strange was supposed to show up at the end of WandaVision and do a lot of what you see him do during this movie. But the actual opening scene is of MCU Doctor Strange having a vision of Defender Strange and America Chavez inside the multiverse waypoint trying to get the Book of the Vashanti and use it as a solution to defeat this demon that they think is chasing America. This is before they've learned that it's MCU Scarlet Witch using runes to use other creatures to go after her before she goes after her herself. Early in the movie they try to foreshadow that it's really her because you see the same runes on both creatures, on this creature here in the waypoint and then on Gargantos later. They made a big deal about runes and witchcraft during WandaVision. They specifically reference witchcraft as in the Scarlet Witch during this movie. Runes. In a given space, only the witch who cast them can use her magic. The runes are why Doctor Strange can't use any magic when he goes to visit MCU Scarlet Witch at the mountain hideaway from the end of WandaVision in that post credit scene. It's the same place that we saw her at in the post credit scene. It's just that when he arrives there, she's created a new version of the Hex, which is why everything looks the way that it does. There are many, many variants in the movies of all the main characters, variants of the Avengers, variants of brand new teams like Patrick Stewart's Professor X, John Krasinski's Reed Richards. I'll talk more specifically about them later in the video when we get to that part of the movie. But this particular variant of Doctor Strange is called Defender Strange because he looks and he's wearing a costume exactly like the version of Doctor Strange from the Defenders comics. He's also wearing a costume looking very similar to the version of Doctor Strange from the recent Secret Wars event, which is what they're teasing during this movie with all the incursions. America Chavez, most of you will recognize from the comics. Her backstory is pretty similar to what it is in the comics. She's born in another pocket dimension, but when she's younger, accidentally activates her powers and sends her parents and herself to alternate universes. She can also enhance her regular attacks with the cosmic energy that she uses to punch holes through different universes. The way they explain her character in the MCU is that she's one of the first people that they know of that the Avengers have actually met who can physically travel across universes in a conscious way, but not the first person to actually come from an alternate universe. We just saw that happen during Spider-Man No Way Home, but that was because of a spell that had gone awry pulling people from alternate dimensions. That's how Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield, all the other Sinister Six characters, the many, many alternate Spider-Man characters at the end of the film almost wound up on planet Earth. Which surprisingly they also canonize now as the official 616 universe, which is the main universe of the comics, like the main continuity. Turns out Mysterio wasn't lying about that. He was lying about all kinds of stuff during that Spider-Man Far From Home movie, but not about the MCU being the 616 universe. There's also an easter egg for this during the Loki series because when Loki's variant is watching his original origin story play out and he sees his own death, the original Loki who died is canonized as Loki 616, as in the Loki from the 616 universe. 
I know a lot of you are asking, what's the difference between an alternate timeline in that version of a variant versus an alternate universe version of a variant versus an alternate dimension? Marvel tends to yada 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 a lot of that explanation. They're all technically different concepts, like a timeline is different from an alternate universe, is different from an alternate dimension, but they might just combine a lot of those concepts because mostly we're just building up to secret wars in this giant multiverse event, which I think will be connected to the Kang multiverse war, just based on the way they simplify everything so that everybody and your grandma can understand what's actually going on. They're going after the Book of the Vashanti from the comics, but in the MCU, it simply just contains anything that someone might need to vanquish their foe. If you cast the spell that's inside it, it will just produce whatever item or scenario you need to win a battle. The 838 universe Illuminati claimed that they used it to defeat their version of Thanos on Titan before they killed their Doctor Strange. In the comics, the book is just meant to be a repository for the most powerful light side good spells in the multiverse. The Vishanti are a huge deal in the comics though, they're like a trio of gods, like we've been learning about gods on Moon Knight, who are like the gods of order in the multiverse, kind of like the living tribunal protects order in the multiverse, which we actually see later in the film. Don't worry, I'll talk about the living tribunal. They're made up of Hogoth, the god of an alien race, Oshtar, one of the elder gods from the same pantheon as Cthone, who's also mentioned in the movie. There'll be a lot of questions about how to pronounce his name too. And the third member of the Vashanti is Oshtar's son, Agamotto, the actual original Sorcerer Supreme. He's kind of like a Thor type character. He was born with God level powers to Oshtar, but born as a man. Oshtar kind of created him in a magical way, the same way that Scarlet Witch created her children, Billy and Tommy, using magic. Agamotto started spending a bunch of his time on Earth studying magic. He created the ancient temple beneath the New York Sanctum that they reference in Spider Man No Way Home. He created the Eye of Agamotto. The third eye in Sinister Strange's forehead, as well as the third eye that appears in MCU Doctor Strange's forehead at the end of the film, is called the Eye of Agamotto. It's meant to represent when a sorcerer has gained a certain level of power. Eventually, Agamotto chose to embrace a more cosmic role, more of his god powers, and became one of these gods of magical order. In the comics, they have a special contract with Doctor Strange and he draws most of his magical energy to power his spells from them, the same way Black Panther has a special contract with Boss the Panther Goddess to gain most of his mystical powers. But Doctor Strange isn't meant to be the avatar of the Vishanti like Moon Knight is the avatar of Khonshu, he just has a contract with them, so he's not their slave or anything like that. The waypoint place in the MCU here where the book is kept is just meant to be the space between all universes like a train depot so to speak. During the movie, different characters are trying to suck out America Chavez's power for themselves. We saw this same effect previously on WandaVision when Agatha Harkness tried to suck out Scarlet Witch's chaos magic for herself. MCU Doctor Strange wakes up after having visions of his alternate selves and different characters that are powerful enough or special enough can actually witness the events of their alternate selves in these other universes sometimes. But it's not meant to be the same as dream walking. Dream walking is when you legit physically control someone else, supplanting their mind with your own across universes. He takes the broken watch that MCU Christine Palmer gave him and heads to her wedding ceremony. At the ceremony, he speaks with one of the former surgeon co-workers from the first film before he became Doctor Strange about the 1 in 14 million plan allowing Thanos to snap half the universe. Several times during the movie, different characters will reference this and whether or not he actually made the right call and make him question whether or not there was an alternate way to defeat Thanos. Did he have to sacrifice Iron Man to save the universe? Because literally we learned that the Illuminati wound up using the Book of the Vishanti and they did not have to sacrifice their Doctor Strange to kill Thanos. They just killed him after the fact because of very different reasons. A lot of you now wondering if they can actually use some time travel now because of what's going on with Kang the Conqueror for Doctor Strange to quote unquote take back his mistake and use that way to bring back Iron Man somehow in the MCU. But really what's going on here is this whole storyline for Doctor Strange in the movie is meant to reference his character arc learning not to always feel like he has to be the one controlling everything because typically it just leads to really bad things happening when he tries to control everything. Like Sinister Strange is meant to be the worst case scenario of that. What I think this is all setting up, all this Infinity War 1 in 14 million talk about him always making the wrong call is there foreshadowing that our MCU Doctor Strange will get an Iron Man similar arc and will eventually sacrifice himself doing the similar type of thing that Iron Man did falling on the sword to save the day instead of pulling another Avengers Endgame Infinity War scenario where he forces someone else to fall on the sword. And that'll probably wind up happening during their big time runs out Secret Wars movie series whatever winds up happening with that because that's what the movie is teasing Secret Wars with all these incursions. Ending that arc is where you would basically end this MCU Doctor Strange's story the same way you ended Iron Man's story with a big sacrifice. They also use the actual wristwatch that MCU Christine Palmer gave him as a literal reference and metaphorical reference to his arc. 
He uses the watch to open the waypoint his alternate self created because in every universe, mostly versions of him have some kind of relationship with the version of Christine Palmer, most of the versions blowing it with their Christine Palmer. But they do set up a potential romance with this Universe 838 version of Christine, which seems way cooler than the MCU Christine anyway. Apparently, MCU Christine Palmer met her husband during that five-year time gap, but her husband is a huge Doctor Strange fanboy. There are a couple points in the film where they joke about this. All the Avengers now are basically celebrities, so they always have funny moments with people trying to get their autographs or take their picture. Like during the Hawkeye series, someone tries to get his autograph while he's in the pisser. And for most of them, it's not like Spider-Man situation with the whole secret identity being a thing. Speaking of which, they do reference Spider-Man a couple times in the events of Spider-Man No Way Home during the film. They confirmed that Doctor Strange remembers everything that happened, everything with Spider-Man No Way Home, fighting with Spider-Man on Titan, the events of Avengers Infinity War, Avengers Endgame. It's just that he does not remember and no one remembers that it's actually Peter Parker underneath the mask. They just remember a version of Spider-Man being there for all this stuff. The funny joke that America Chavez and Doctor Strange talk about Spider-Man shooting webs out of his butt is actually a deep cut for James Cameron's version of Spider-Man he was going to do during the 90s. During the script that he wrote for that movie, he was going to have his version of Spider-Man have a wet dream and basically instead of the you know usual problem happening when you have a wet dream, he was actually going to get all excited and shoot webs out of himself. So webs were really going to come out of all of his extremities. I'd rather not talk about this. No, I don't mean but to. Are you teasing me? No, 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 no. As you can imagine, Sony decided to not go in that direction when they hired Sam Raimi to do Tommy McGuire's version of Spider-Man. Like, okay, he has organic web shooters, but he's not needing to shoot webs out of his junk or out of his butt. Gargantos attacks in the street. He changes into his regular robes, the Cloak of Levitation, to save America Chavez. In the movie, the whole thing they have going on with this is Gargantos actually looks more like classic Shuma Gorth from the comics, who's more of a legit Doctor Strange villain. But the whole problem they have with this is that Shuma Gorth actually belongs to the Conan IP and right now Marvel doesn't have the rights to that so they just call the creature Gargantos even though he looks like Shuma Gorth. And for instance, Shuma Gorth comes from an interdimensional place. He was born in a place kind of like the Waypoint that they visit where the Book of the Vishanti is kept. But if this had been actual Shuma Gorth, there's no way they would have been able to kill him like this because for instance, Dormammu was the student of Shuma Gorth. He studied a lot of his magic underneath him. That's how powerful Shuma Gorth is. As per tradition, a lot of the signs all over the frames are all filled with numbers and Easter eggs. On the bus, it reads number 6192. That's a reference to comic book Infinity Wars in the movie, calling back to MCU Infinity War, obviously. On the left side of the frame, the sign reads Magic Plus T, which foreshadows the Universe 838 Sorcerer Supreme Bear Mordo using the Magic T to knock them out. On the right side of the frame, the cab reads P307. The closest reference I can think of is because this is Sam Raimi directing the movie is a reference to Spider-Man 3, which came out in 2007, starring Tobey Maguire's Peter Parker, which we just saw in the MCU. Also in this scene, they have the street corner pizza place, which you could think of as another Spider-Man 2 pizza time reference as pizza becomes a big recurring theme in the movie with Bruce Campbell's pizza balls later in the Illuminati's universe and America Chavez saying that she eats pizza in every universe that she goes to. Pizza time. Surprisingly, despite having a genius level intellect, we learn MCU Doctor Strange has not taken the time to learn Spanish, but Wong does speak it. I already explained all the Spider-Man jokes that they tell during the movie, but also America Chavez explains that she has not been to a universe yet where there is a version of Spider-Man, like it's a brand new concept to her. So she hasn't been to Tobey Maguire's universe, she hasn't been to Andrew Garfield's universe, or the Venom universe. Wong reveals there are secret books and information that you get on top of everything when you become Sorcerer Supreme. I think this is just to allow them some room in the future with some kind of plot twist when Doctor Strange 3 or whenever Secret Wars rolls around with them whipping out more secret books of magic that they didn't know about before because he has not become Sorcerer Supreme yet. Then we see MCU Scarlet Witch having the same type of dream vision that Doctor Strange just had into her universe 838 self in a version of their house in Westview with her children Billy and Tommy. They even play the music cue from WandaVision. A lot of the music gets reused from WandaVision in the previous Doctor Strange movies. The way Elizabeth Olsen explained these alternate versions of Scarlet Witch, she said that because she's not wearing a wedding band in any of these alternate scenes, in this alternate reality, there's no version of Vision in the equation and they have just broken up or separated at some point in the past. But because there is a version of Billy and Tommy who exist here and in many other universes, they had something similar to the events of the Hex go down, but somehow she was able to perma-keep her children. They didn't vanish when she took the Hex down. The way Elizabeth Olsen explained all this is that she said they wanted the story to be about her just getting back to a version of her children and incorporate the multiverse because they wanted to lead up to Secret Wars. 
So that's why in the movie, you don't see her searching the multiverse for another version of Vision or trying to find MCU white Vision and why they didn't have her just try to create another version of Billy and Tommy in the MCU doing the same thing she did last time. It is the same version of the actors who played Billy and Tommy on WandaVision. And I believe they ended the movie with Billy and Tommy the way they did with Scarlet Witch agreeing to not search the multiverse anymore, just kind of leave all these alternate versions on other worlds to their own families is so that in the future when they do a Young Avengers movie or a Young Avengers series, they can bring back older versions of Billy and Tommy from the future of some other universe played by different adult actors. And it'll make sense. You'll be like, oh, these are just different variants from another universe, but they still feel like family is forever. There's that quote during the movie that she has, family is forever, which is also a quote from WandaVision. So the idea is that when MCU Scarlet Witch eventually does come back, don't worry, I'll get to that too, because Elizabeth Olsen was talking about the way that her character ended she'll still feel like these other variants that might show up in the future who are adults are still her family, her children, even though they're technically from another universe. Kevin Feige always thinking like 10 years ahead. Then Doctor Strange goes to visit MCU Scarlet Witch at the same place she was at during the WandaVision post credit scene studying the Darkhold. She references her version of Vision having told her about the dangers of the multiverse, the existence of the multiverse previously, which is actually where she got the idea to search for alternate versions of Billy and Tommy. The reason why everything eventually turns around her looking red and dead is because the dark hold is meant to corrupt the user and corrupting everything around it. So if she'd been using the dark hold, for instance, in the middle of New York City for this long, then there'd be like a whole city block of New York City that would look like a wasteland. Doctor Strange makes a joke about bug themed Avengers. That's a Spider-Man No Way Home reference and an Ant-Man 3 reference because obviously we just saw No Way Home and we're getting Ant-Man 3 at the beginning of next year, which will be like the next big piece of the Secret Wars puzzle with Kang the Conqueror and the Kang Multiverse War. He also jokes about getting herself back on the Avengers Lunchbox merch. That's another WandaVision Hex reference. Like I said, there was going to be a deleted scene at the end of the WandaVision finale where Doctor Strange showed up and sort of took her to task about what she had done because even before she starts killing people during the movie going after America Chavez, she was considered a fugitive on the lam, like she was hiding out from the law, which they do briefly reference. Like Doctor Strange says, no, you did a lot of wrong stuff, but I'm not here to talk about that. So that's them kind of hand waving over the end of WandaVision. Like, yes, you were definitely a fugitive from the law, but we have multiverse problems here, so that's more important. Then when he learns the truth about her really being behind all this, she uses what he did during Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame with the Infinity Gauntlet and the Snap, another reference to him messing with the multiverse and technically maybe making the wrong call and messing with the multiverse again during Spider-Man No Way Home as justification for what she's doing. When he tries to tell her that her children are not real, you created them with magic, her big clapback is that don't all mothers create their children with magic, metaphorically. They have their big battle during Kamartage, and the way they portray Scarlet Witch during this movie is that she's meant to be the most powerful magic user inside the MCU, but the whole thing is that Doctor Strange is way more learned, he's a much smarter magician, so he uses that to try and keep her at bay, but if you think about it, none of the regular characters that you expect are actually able to defeat her. They're not able to stop her Doctor Strange, none of the other Illuminati characters, it's actually the version of Billy and Tommy who cause her to chill and realize what she's done, and that's why she stops. If she had decided to keep going, they would have had to go one step up to the Living Tribunal or someone even more powerful. Like, where's the Beyonder? Where's that version of Franklin Richards? Seriously, though, they mentioned Franklin Richards in this movie. He is like the most powerful living humanoid character in the Marvel Universe next to the Beyonder. But he's like a little kid. Maybe adult Franklin Richards would be able to stop Scarlet Witch. The other big thing they show you during this battle is that the order from all the different sanctums all unite from across the planet to fight at Kamartage because that's sort of like their connective waypoint where they all go to study. They also introduce the Rintra Minotaur, who's another big magical character from the comics. She starts messing with people's minds, which is a big callback to her giving everyone visions in Age of Ultron, but she also did that during WandaVision. He tries to trap her in the mirror dimension, but she's so powerful, she uses the reflections against them in the room and is able to escape way quicker than Doctor Strange was when Spider-Man trapped him in that same dimension. You know what's cooler than magic? <laughs> Math. You notice her fingers have turned black, just like Agatha Harkness's, because both of them have been corrupted by long-term use of the Darkhold. And the whole thing with this corruption that you get from the book is actually part of the plot with Cthone. He's like the god of chaos, the origin of Scarlet Witch's chaos magic. They claim in the MCU that he's the person who created the original Darkhold Temple in every copy that you see of the book in the MCU across the multiverse, which is transcribed from that original one temple. So there's only one Darkhold Temple for the entire multiverse. An MCU Scarlet Witch is meant to be the main Scarlet Witch conquering the entire multiverse, but the whole idea is that Cthone did that to take advantage of her and himself conquer the entire multiverse. 
He's part of this pantheon of elder gods that ruled over the MCU dimension a long time ago until he was kicked out, and he's been trying to use ways like the Darkhold Chaos Magic to break back in and take over ever since. They give him a little bit of an upgrade during this movie, saying that he's trying to use the Darkhold Temple, Scarlet Witch, as a sort of backdoor to conquer the entire multiverse. He's the person in the comics who gave Scarlet Witch her chaos magic when she was born as part of this sort of grand plan to use her to conquer everything eventually. But I think part of the idea is that they wouldn't actually show him on screen unless they do an actual Scarlet Witch solo movie, which it sounds like they might do at some point, because if you don't see a body, like at the end of the movie, she blows up the temple, if you don't see a body, that means that they're not dead. Common comic book language. Elizabeth Olsen also said that she believes that Scarlet Witch is still alive at the end of the film. Is Wanda really dead? What is the future of Wanda? She could never go away, I don't think, especially with the multiverse. But I don't know. I, I think she's I think she's aware of what she's what she's done. Um, but no, I don't think she's gone. When Scarlet Witch says that she killed her own husband and it meant nothing, ultimately, it's a sick Infinity War burn because she's referencing how she killed Vision to try and destroy the Mind Stone to prevent Thanos from getting it. But all he had to do was just use the Time Stone to rewind time. So she killed him for nothing. Then they go through a huge montage of a bunch of different universes, all of them having really funny, really cool Easter eggs. They start with them passing by the legit actual MCU Living Tribunal, which is meant to be a big Infinity War deleted scene callback. Originally during the MCU Infinity War, when they were having their battle on Titan, Doctor Strange was going to take Thanos on this grand tour of the multiverse like he went on, and at the end of it, he was going to take him to the MCU Living Tribunal to be judged. They deleted it for obvious reasons because it just became too extra, like they'd have to explain who is the Living Tribunal, and Thanos was going to wind up beating him anyway because he was going to wind up snapping the Infinity Gauntlet at the end of the film no matter what. It's supposed to be one of the most powerful cosmic characters in the entire multiverse next to the one above all, which is like the one true god of the entire multiverse. The next place they go is just this place of pure energy, then they crash through a dimension that's just pure crystalline, then they travel through a version of New York City which is populated by giant insects, then they travel through a version of Earth where New York is totally underwater, like it doesn't exist, it's all underwater. Then there's another more regular version of New York City with a Grindhouse movie Easter egg, which is like a whole genre of movies. Grindhouse movies, typically low budget, really hardcore types of films. You could think of the original Evil Dead movie, like the really low budget Evil Dead movie, as being a Grindhouse type of film. Then there's a universe where everything is super advanced, hyper efficient, like there are tubes running around everywhere. Then they travel through a hell-like universe where everything in New York City here is on fire and dead. There are skeletons climbing around in the background and screaming. They travel through a universe that's still in the Jurassic era period with dinosaurs. That could also be an Easter egg for the Savage Land from the X-Men comics. They travel through an animated universe, and the animation does kind of look like the 3D animation style from What If. So you could call it the What If universe, but technically on that show, it was like the entire multiverse was animated. It wasn't just one universe. Then there's an ice universe where everything is frozen over with green magic energy as if the planet has been taken over by Loki. It's meant to be a big Thor movie reference. Like it's a universe where Loki conquered the planet and it became a frost giant colony, which they also kind of did during the What If series where Loki winds up conquering the Earth. There's a block universe, which I think we're just calling the Minecraft universe. There's a paint universe that they reference later in the film where everything exists as paint. America Chavez says that you shouldn't get stuck there because it's really hard to put stuff in your mouth and eat when your body is paint. There's a black and white 1930s universe with a Mickey Mouse Looney Tunes style laughing. It's just them screaming like their scream continues and the scream changes form like the sound changes form because you exist differently in different universes. But the reason why it looks that way, why it sounds that way is because I think that it's meant to be a Steamboat Willie reference. Like it's a reference to the origin of Disney itself because Marvel is owned by Disney now. There's a universe where the Kree have conquered Earth and turned it into their colony. Then there's another advanced universe that looks all Blade Runner. We'll call this the Spider-Man 2099 universe. We actually saw a version of him during Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse trailer. Oscar Isaac, MCU Moon Knight also plays their Spider-Man 2099. There's another hyper-advanced universe where everything looks all clean as if it's designed to look kind of like an Apple store. They travel through a universe where it seems like humanity either never developed or suffered some catastrophe and the Earth broke apart because it's all covered in lava flows. And because we're getting the Obi-Wan Kenobi episodes, you could also think of this as like the Mustafar looking universe with lava everywhere. Like they do actually have the high ground literally during this scene when they're flying through the air. Then they finally wind up in the 838 universe, the Illuminati's universe, and everything just looks all utopian. The number 838 isn't meant to be a comic book reference to anything specifically, it's just something that they created for the movie. 
But because of the way they explain things, in this universe, they have a version of the X-Men mutants who exist everywhere. They have a version of the Fantastic Four. Their version of Captain Carter had an origin story similar to the version from What If, where Peggy Carter got the super soldier serum from Steve Rogers. The Inhumans exist in this universe because Anson Mount, Black Bolt, the Terrigen Miss. And the way they explain all these versions is that they're meant to be similar to what we've seen before, like some of them are big Easter eggs, obviously, but they're meant to be brand new versions. In this universe, they had a version of their Infinity War. At some point, they developed the Illuminati team to fight Thanos' other big threats instead of just letting the Avengers or other teams handle everything by themselves. They make a lot of references to the Illuminati being this think tank team making a lot of hard choices. They kind of have this sinister vibe to them. That's exactly right out of the comics. Brian Michael Bendis created the team and it was just meant to be the most powerful characters in the Marvel Universe coming together to solve even bigger cosmic level problems. They reveal that in their universe, their version of Doctor Strange tried to take on Thanos himself, saw a lot of these problems their self using the Darkhold and Dreamwalk looking in the multiverse, but ultimately it just corrupted him and then they eventually turn to the Book of the Vashanti, use it to kill their version of Thanos as you see his dead body impaled on Titan. So the snap never wound up happening in their universe. And because they felt like their version of Doctor Strange only presented a threat long term, like he was turning into a version of Sinister Strange ultimately, they had their version of Black Bolt kill him using his ability. They make a joke about food across the multiverse mostly being free in all universes. Like it's weird that it costs money in your universe, but apparently it also costs money in this universe too because they have Bruce Campbell's big cameo scene. He's selling Papa's pizza balls on the street and yells at them about paying for their food. Bruce Campbell, most people will remember from all of Sam Raimi's movies in some way, most notably for playing Ash during the Evil Dead series, and a lot of tropes from those movies wind up being tropes during Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness. But he also cameoed during all Sam Raimi's Spider-Man films, and would have also cameoed in Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man 4 as a version of Mysterio had that wound up happening. Doctor Strange winds up enchanting his body to attack itself. It's also meant to be a reference to the Evil Dead series where Ash's hand gets possessed and starts attacking him until he cuts it off. That's how he got his chainsaw hand in those movies. The second post credit scene is meant to be a big joke about that. They set up his cloak of levitation tearing so that 838 Christine can repair it and it starts to look more comic book accurate, but his costume just in general in this movie is much more comic accurate than in previous movies. Their version of Mordo, Sorcerer Supreme, uses the T in the Sands of Nisanti to put them both to sleep. In the comics, the Sands do the exact same thing. They just temporarily negate people's magical powers. And in the movie, Christine explains that she created these special gauntlets to just dampen all of his powers. When MCU Scarlet Witch dream walks to possess A3A Scarlet Witch, behind her on TV, you see Billy and Tommy are watching a version of Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. That's meant to be the precursor for the actual original Mickey Mouse cartoon, Steamboat Willie, which is another big Disney callback. They also watch a version of Snow White, which is meant to be more of a literal reference to their mother being put to sleep, so to speak, trapped in her own mind while MCU Scarlet Witch controls her body. Back at Kamartage, they explain that the Darkhold will destroy anyone who tries to destroy it. But like I explained earlier, it's just meant to be a copy of the writings inside the Darkhold temple that Cthone built in ancient times. When they say it's on Mount Wundagore, that's meant to be a big reference to Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver's origin story in the comics. They were taken to Wundagore by the cow person called Bova after they were born to Magneto and Magna. The only difference is that when they were taken there, they were taken to the High Evolutionary's castle. Even though he doesn't really figure into their backstory right here in the MCU as far as we know, we will meet MCU High Evolutionary during Guardians of the Galaxy 3, so I think his origin story will be just a little bit different. There was an easter egg for Bova during WandaVision though, but she isn't meant to be the same type of minotaur that Rintra is. They're both completely different types of characters. The chaos magic beasts that they find protecting the temple are designed to look kind of like Cthone was, so his face kind of looks like this. There's an image of Scarlet Witch on the back wall that's identical to the one inside the Darkhold, and some of the text and symbols on the walls also look kind of like the symbols from the Eternals movie, which I think is just meant to be a connection to the ancient nature of Cthone himself. Like the Celestials themselves are ancient, so is Cthone, the god of chaos. The reason why he chose this particular universe to build the Darkhold Temple and use this main version of Scarlet Witch to conquer the entire multiverse is because, they explained during Spider-Man No Way Home, there are these crazy powerful cosmic magical ley lines that run through this particular universe's version of Earth and a lot of things are built to take advantage of that. That's why Akimoto built this ancient temple to take advantage of those ley lines. It's the same reason why Cthone would have built the Darkhold Temple in this particular universe. When he meets the Illuminati, he's escorted to the chamber by the variants of the Ultron robots. They even reference the Ultron protocol, except in this reality, they were able to control them and use them for good. 
They're basically this universe's version of Iron Man's Iron Legion, but we don't actually see this universe's version of Iron Man. So either he wasn't around or he wasn't on this iteration of the team or just gave them some of his tech or he died at some point before the movie. So there was some Iron Man stuff during the film, but not actual Iron Man variants on screen. There's a seventh empty chair in the Illuminati chamber. I believe that the empty chair would have belonged to his character because Baron Mordo would have replaced a version of Doctor Strange. So it's not like there have been eight chairs for Iron Man. Then when they introduce each of the different members, they play some of their classic music cues. Like when they introduce Captain Carter, they play some of the classic Captain America music. They call her the first Avenger in this universe, just like MCU Captain America. She looks exactly like the version from What If. She says the iconic line during the movie too, I could do this all day. I can do this all day. Yeah, I know. I know. Then even though this universe's version of Baron Mordo had replaced Doctor Strange on the team, they never explained what happened to MCU Baron Mordo. I know there are a lot of questions about that, but the actor said that MCU Mordo did not get snapped and he's still alive out there somewhere inside the MCU. They have Anson Mount playing a version of Black Bolt. He was also from the Inhumans TV series. They also reference the Terrigen Mist. So just the Inhumans in general are canon to the MCU now through the multiverse. They have a version of Maria Rambeau, who's Captain Marvel. Her origin story, because she's a test pilot, just like Carol Danvers, is that on the day when they had that big accident with the Tesseract pilot, she just happened to be the one flying the plane instead of Carol Danvers. And if you haven't watched a lot of those movies, Maria Rambeau is the mother of Monica Rambeau. Monica Rambeau will actually come back during the Marvel's movie, Captain Marvel 2. She also has powers too, but different types of powers. They have John Krasinski playing Reed Richards, fulfilling all of our fan casting dreams. Fantastic Four now canon to the MCU through the multiverse. They call him the smartest man alive. That's another comic book reference too. They also reference the Baxter Foundation, the Baxter Building, which we all kind of think has taken the place of the old Avengers Tower. And at least in this universe, he said he's already married to a version of Sue Storm and they have both of their children, Franklin Richards and Valeria Richards. When they joke about them charting in the 60s, he's making a joke about the origin story of the Fantastic Four because they debuted during the early 60s and it's also meant to be a Beatles joke. Like the four Beatles. They're the very first family of superheroes that Stan Lee ever created in the comics, which is why Kevin Feige later referred to them as Marvel's first family in the movie they're creating in the MCU. I'm happy to announce a film about one of the truly iconic Marvel families. In fact, Marvel's first family, Fantastic Four. Then they introduce Patrick Stewart's Professor X, who, like I said, is meant to be a variant very similar to the one from the X-Men animated series. He's got the same yellow chair. He's wearing the exact same costume as that version of Professor X. And when he floats in on the same yellow chair, they also play the X-Men animated series theme song. When Scarlet Witch starts attacking them, their Professor X also repeats a line of dialogue, which is from X-Men Days of Future Past, when he tells our Doctor Strange, just because someone stumbles and loses their way doesn't mean that they are lost forever. The funny thing about the Scarlet Witch versus the Illuminati fight is that a lot of the technique she uses, a lot of the vibe of the character, is her going full Thanos from Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame, doing some of the similar things, similar types of attacks that he used during those movies. You took everything from me. I don't even know who you are, except make it Scarlet Witch. For instance, she turns Reed Richards into ribbons the same way Thanos did to the Guardians of the Galaxy. For the most part, most of these members of the Illuminati wind up getting killed, but not all of them get killed. Patrick Stewart himself said that he was planning on coming back too, so even though he does get killed during the movie, he said he'll probably come back as a different variant in some future film. So for instance, John Krasinski can come back to do the Fantastic Four movie in the MCU. He could also direct it now too because John Watts isn't doing it anymore. But when Professor X goes into her mind to try and stop her, free the original Wanda, the place he enters with this door, the rubble, is designed to look like a version of her house from WandaVision all destroyed, a metaphor for MCU Wanda destroying the life of the other Wanda so she can take it for herself. Also, her being buried under all this rubble is a callback to the young Wanda as a child being trapped in all the rubble of her house in the Stark Tech missile. But RIP because she snaps his neck too. When they're running through the basement of the Illuminati base, you see all this old paperwork, this old timey stuff down here. This is meant to be a callback like you saw during Avengers Endgame. All this is meant to belong to Professor X because he would have been very active during the 60s. So it's like in Avengers Endgame when they go into the old Camp Lehigh base in the 70s and you see all this old timey tech. I believe the idea is that this whole mansion here, this whole area is Professor Xavier's mansion, like it belongs to him financially. They go into the waypoint, but Scarlet Witch winds up burning the Book of the Vishanti. There was only one for the entire multiverse, so it doesn't exist anymore. But the actual Vishanti gods who created it are still around, so they can always go to them unless Gore the God Butcher winds up killing them too. They wind up going to Sinister Strange's universe, and it's basically what we thought it was from the comics, just a universe where reality has basically collapsed on itself and is about to die. 
pretty much the same thing that happened to the universe from What If, where Supreme Strange destroyed his entire universe trying to gain more power. Sinister Strange explained that he'd gotten so bad that he started killing Doctor Strange's and other universes by dream walking and forcing them to kill themselves by just having them walk their bodies off of ledges. He also says that he lost some giant multiverse battle to someone but never says who. I think that he was talking about Kang the Conqueror or a version of him because so much of the movies foreshadowing Secret Wars, this giant multiverse battle in alternate universes, and that's basically what a version of the Kang multiverse war is. He whips out his third eye from the comics, and even though he has been corrupted by his use of the dark hole, he's super evil, the third eye itself isn't meant to be inherently evil. It's basically a manifestation of the eye of Agamotto, which is like a power that sorcerers can attain after they've expanded their abilities to a certain point. Same thing happens to our Doctor Strange at the end of the movie. He manifests his third eye because he's become so much more powerful, learned so much more, but also, just like Sinister Strange, he's been corrupted, so there's that threat too. They have their big musical battle. Danny Elfman, who did music for the movie, also wrote special music for the battle itself when they're literally grabbing notes off the page and turning them into weapons against each other. After he kills Sinister Strange, they wind up using the Darkhold to dreamwalk into the dead body of Defender Strange, which winds up turning him into a big Marvel Zombies Easter egg. Then you see all these souls of the damned that he talks about coming to stop him because what he's doing is so forbidden on a magical level. I think they're trying to connect this back to the Darkhold, Chaos Magic, and Cthone because they say it's the Souls of the Damned in Agatha Harkness called the Darkhold the Book of the Damned, so I think that all just connects back to Cthone. They say Doctor Strange is going to suffer eternal cosmic consequences because of what he's doing. I think that means eventually he'll have to face a version of Cthone or some other high-level dimensional demons like Marvel's Fear Lords, Nightmare, make all the Mephisto jokes that you want. The cauldron that Christine uses to save him also seems like the one from the first Doctor Strange movie inside the case, which might be another Vashanti reference. She says, praise you above the light as she activates it. Then when America Chavez uses Wanda's children against her, she frightens them so badly they think she's like the Wicked Witch of the West, which they had a bunch of references to during WandaVision. And it's her children who cause her to realize what she's done. She chills out. She frees everyone, destroys the Darkhold Temple. Remember, it's the only temple in the entire multiverse, which consequently winds up destroying all copies of the Darkhold across the multiverse. I think that's more to let you know that in the future, someone isn't going to be able to just whip out another Darkhold and do the exact same thing that they did during this movie. There is a flash of chaos magic as the temple kind of crumbles around itself. And like I said, Elizabeth Olsen said she's not dead. There have been rumors about them doing a Scarlet Witch solo movie at some point. They wind up taking Christine back to her Illuminati universe and kind of set up a possible romance between her and MCU Doctor Strange. We'll see how Clea feels about that too because she was married to Doctor Strange in the comics for a long time. America Chavez starts training in Kamarta. She references the sling rings being so hard to use. That's a callback to the first Doctor Strange movie with him not being able to open portals on his first try. They set up her whole arc finding her parents in another universe someday. Like I said, they came originally from a pocket universe so they might be singular amongst the multiverse. She said that there are no variants of her in any universe, so she's like the true meaning of a nexus being inside the comics. There's meant to be only one version of her for the entire multiverse. Doctor Strange finally bows to Wong, which they had referenced earlier in the movie because he's Sorcerer Supreme, and then repairs the watch MCU Christine gave him as a way to put a bow on his character arc from the movie. Like, he's learned a lot, but it's kind of ironic because even though he's fixing the watch, he's not fixing reality. Things just get worse, as implied by the post credit scene. He walks out on the street all happy, then in a classic Sam Raimi record drop moment, drops to his knees, starts screaming as the third eye emerges on his forehead. But it's not all a bad thing. Like him getting the third eye is an expression of how powerful he's gotten. But then right after that, during the first post credit scene, Charlize Theron's Clea from the comic shows up from the dark dimension to tell him that he's just caused another incursion and they're going to go fix it, taking him back to the dark hole dimension. So if you don't know who Clea is, she's actually a really big deal. She is Doctor Strange's true love interest from the comic. She's another ultra powerful sorceress from the Dark Dimension, and she's the daughter of the former ruler of this Dark Dimension before Dormammu took over. She's actually Dormammu's niece. She's the daughter of Dormammu's twin sister. But obviously that's just teasing more universes colliding with each other in a big time runs out scenario. We'll have to combine the fragments of the limited multiverse that's left into a single battle world scenario. Maybe they'll introduce a version of Doctor Doom at some point and do a legit version of Secret Wars. The second post credit scene is just meant to be a funny tag scene with Bruce Campbell's pizza ball seller who looks at his hand then looks at the camera saying aha it's finally over kind of breaking the fourth wall. I talked about this in my previous video too. It's a reference to a couple of different things, like he's breaking the fourth wall, kind of like Deadpool, like it's a Deadpool joke. He's making fun of the movie being over, like, haha, the movie's finally over, and recognizing that he's a fictional character in a movie. 
It's also him laughing about Doctor Strange's spell being over, he's not hitting himself anymore, and it's also meant to be a big Sam Raimi easter egg to Evil Dead with his evil hand not trying to kill him anymore. But there's so many things to talk about, you could watch the movie a billion more times and there's still more easter eggs to find that I didn't talk about in the video, so if you did see some that I didn't mention, write them below in the comments. I've got a whole bunch of other bonus videos for really specific things from the movie plan, so if you have any big questions about things specifically or you want me to do videos about, let me know in the comments. Everyone click here for my full Doctor Strange 2 post credit scene video and easter eggs and click here for my Doctor Strange 2 review video. Thank you so much for watching, everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.